All right, let's continue on with our study of an introduction to field equations. And we are going to today talk about the Klein-Gordon field. Now, we're going to do, we should cover, at a minimum, we're going to cover the Klein-Gordon field and the Dirac field, right? And um, we're also going to discuss some of Maxwell's equations uh, in order to make additional progress into this area. I'm, all, I'm considering all of this as prerequisites to QED, even though usually this stuff is presented in the introduction to QED in an actual QED course. So it, this is the material you learn at the front end of a QED course before you actually start studying the quantization of, of, of electrodynamics or any quantum field theory. And because of that, I consider it prerequisites. It's just shoved in the beginning of the course because people don't usually have the time to study field equations in their classical mechanics uh, curriculum. So let's go ahead and have a look. All right, so last time we studied these conventions that we were using. And as a very quick review, um, I think the point here is that I'm trying to now use the conventions that you find in the literature as opposed to making claims about the conventions that I prefer. So the way the, the literature goes, in particular, the Peskin and Schroeder, I think, is the book I'm going to follow the most here. This, uh, the metric is given in terms of this sort of matrix structure, which I don't really like, but uh, uh, frequently you'll see the metric in quantum field theory textbooks with a G, despite the fact that it's always flat, right? In the elementary form of the theory, space-time is flat everywhere. So, so the metric is not really a function of X, right? It, it is in the sense that it's constant, right? So you can just write the plain old metric and always count on it being this thing right here, as long as you're in some sort of standard Cartesian coordinate system. And then I'll remind you that last time uh, I pointed out that in red, I'll try to use the convention when uh, C, well, usually the convention will be C equals H bar equals 1. Notice that we don't have to worry about G in the conventional theory. When you say that quantum field theory is a study of fields in a uh, without the presence of gravity, what you're saying is that this guy is constant everywhere in space-time, right? That's what we mean when we say there's no gravity involved, right? The metric doesn't, uh, the metric is, um, is always, uh, every point in space-time at the same time, can be, there can be a coordinate change. All right, let's get this very formal. Because you, you could be in a spherical coordinate system, for example, in which case the metric isn't really the same at every point in space-time. On the other hand, there's a coordinate transformation whereby the metric can be turned into this form at every point at the same, uh, I shouldn't say at the same time, but together, right? So the entire metric can be put into a coordinate system where this is true everywhere, right? Anyway, that's sort of a small point. But I'm going to try to use this C equals H bar equals 1 convention for most of the work. But from time to time, I, I feel like it will be worth our while to introduce C's and H bars. Okay. Anyway, so we discussed this the last time, and now we're going to discuss the classical Klein-Gordon field. So the first thing we have to understand is what are we even talking about, right? We're talking about a field. So we are going to create a physics of fields, and right now we're going to talk about the classical Klein-Gordon field. So in, before we even begin all of this stuff, where we're going to talk about a Lagrangian and the field equations, let's just make sure we understand what we mean by a field, and then what the distinction is between a classical and a, and a quantum field. So remember, the idea is that we are working in space-time. So we have some kind of coordinate system on our space-time, and I'm just going to draw it with these little lines. And remember, this is an assumption, right? This is an assumption of how the world works. World is whatever is in the world is homeomorphic to a four-dimensional manifold. And there's some metric on the manifold, and we've assumed what that metric is. That metric is eta mu nu, just as we've defined in the convention. So it's in the absence of gravity. So we know that every point in space-time can be labeled 
And we, because this mapping is homeomorphic, we can create physics on this abstract space of reality by studying the abstract space of a four-dimensional manifold. When I say an abstract space of reality, that sounds kind of weird. But what I'm saying is we're taking reality and we're just arbitrarily saying that it is modeled by a 4D manifold. We don't own these maps, right? There is no real map from like reality to these 4D manifolds. We just start with the 4D manifold and say, that's good because we're assuming these maps exist, whatever they are, and we can operate everything here and uh, uh, create our models in four-dimensional space. So a field, what does a field do? Well, a field goes to any given point in four-dimensional space, for example, this point right here, and it gives it a number. It assigns it some kind of number. Well, I should say it's assigned to some sort of mathematical object, but in this case, we could say it assigns a real number or it assigns a complex number. And if, it's, if it assigns a real or a complex number, we're gonna call the field a scalar field, right? But of course, it could assign at this point, it could assign a, no kidding, vector, right? We could put a vector at this point. We've studied this a lot in previous iterations of this, of, of my coursework that I've put on, 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 on the channel. But if you put a vector here, then, you know, presumably you would have to define it by the three components of the vector, x, y, and z, right? The x, y, z components of the vector. Let me be more specific, right? Let me, let me say like the electric field, right? Because we're going to talk about that later. So the x component of the electric field, the y component of the electric field, and the z component of the electric field. And that is now a vector field because we've placed a vector at every point in space-time. And there's a lot of different mathematical objects you can put at every point in space-time, including spinners and tensors and all kinds of stuff. But what we're going to be interested in today is a scalar field, where a single real number or a single complex number is put at every single point in space-time. Now, why would you do this? Well, you do this because you think there's some physics that is best modeled this way. And in fact, the obvious case is an electric field, right? We know that if you have an electric field in space, the idea is that the force on a charged particle is the charge on the particle times, oops, times the electric field strength, the, the, the electric field, right? That's the force. This is a vector equation, right? So that's how you define this. You say, well, there's these weird forces that we've observed in the world and we don't understand how they work because they seem to work at a distance, right? There's, there's things that pull particles and we can't see. It's not like little people are pushing these particles around uh, or batting them with sticks. They seem to be just moving all on their own. So, you know, I think there's something sitting inside of space that we might call a vector field that uh, interacts with certain particles that have this property that we could call charge and ergo we start creating physical models this way, right? So this is the one that everybody definitely knows uh, if you're approaching the subject of quantum field theory. You certainly know uh, classical electrodynamics. And so you know these, these vector fields make perfect sense. But what about scalar fields, right? So scalar fields are a little different. You could imagine, say, a fluid, and the density of a fluid at any given point is given by a scalar number. And a law of physics would tell you how that density changes with time, right? Just like we're now going to seek laws of physics that tell us how the electric field changes with time. How does the electric field evolve in time, right? It has to evolve with respect to time. And that's what a physical law is, right? The physical law tells us how these things change with time. And you have to put all the parts into the expression and you, you get these rules. And of course, Maxwell's equations are going to be very germane to how the electric field changes with time, for example. And if we were talking about a fluid where we have some kind of scalar field that represents the density of the fluid, you know, it's the Navier-Stokes equations that would tell us how that field changes with time. So when we study the Klein-Gordon equation, we are looking for a scalar field we're talking we're positing the existence of a scalar 
field in space-time. And that's what this is. This is space-time. Okay, so let's talk more about the Klein-Gordon equation. So now we're back at, at our expression, at what is going to be our mathematical model of the Klein-Gordon equation, of a scalar field. And our, let's get our pieces correct, right? Phi is the scalar field. So phi is a function on space-time, where we're going to say the space-time point is x. And x is a stand-in for x0, x1, x2, and x3, which are the coordinates of the point in space-time. And so phi is a function of those four coordinates. So these two things are <clears throat> mathematically the same. Notice it's not really, it's a little abusive to write this. Phi is a function of x mu, because that would almost imply that there are four functions a function of x0, a function of x1, you know, etc. And that's not exactly right. But you sometimes do see this kind of notation. Um, actually, you see it pretty often. And it's a bit abusive, but it's obvious enough, right? The point is, is you're looking for uh, a, a real or complex number, depending on whether phi is a real scalar field or a complex scalar field. And it puts a value at every single point in space-time. So, how do we discuss the physics of such a thing, right? Say we, there is, this is, some part of reality is modeled this way, and we need to create a field. How would we discuss the physics of such a thing? Well, we, we have a foundational notion of how physics works in the classical world. One approach, which we studied in previous uh, lectures in this prerequisite series, is we take the Lagrangian approach to physics, right? We write down a Lagrangian, and the elements of the Lagrangian are no longer the generalized coordinates and their first derivatives with respect to time. Now it's the field variable, uh, or the field itself, and the field's derivative with respect to time. And we can write down Lagrangians like that. And once we write down the Lagrangian, the equations of motion follow which we've already studied from the Euler-Euler-Lagrange equations. And so every Lagrangian we write down for a field gives us some physics that we can now study, right? We, remember, the Lagrangian will give us the action, and minimizing the action gives us the equations of motion, right? This is a fundamental prerequisite understanding of how classical mechanics works. Lagrangian action equation of motion. And so, for every, so if we're going to posit a field that exists in reality, a field that models reality, we have to posit a Lagrangian. So the Klein-Gordon field is basically the scalar field that follows from this Lagrangian. This is a way of approaching the notion of a Klein-Gordon field. Now notice it's a classical field, right? What I've just outlined, this thing here, this is classical physics. So... All we have now, and, and it's very akin to particle physics, right? It's just now there's an infinite number of particles, one sort of at every place in space-time, in a sense. You could think of it that way. And the motion of, of the field is how the values at each point change in time. So this Lagrangian is, uh, is, is where we're going to start. This is the definition of the Klein-Gordon field, in some sense, is the field that uh, is defined whose physical properties are all encoded in this Lagrangian. Now, I've written the Lagrangian in two different ways, right? This is the uh, sort of the classical way of writing it, the field's first derivative with respect to time, the value of that first derivative squared, and this is the gradient of the field squared, and then this m is a parameter, and then the value of the field itself squared, right? And you've got and that's the classical Klein-Gordon field Lagrangian. Now, we can write this in a covariant way by combining the time derivative part and the space derivative part, and we write it, this part here can be written just like this, one-half partial mu phi squared. Now, this gets a little confusing, right, because partial mu phi squared is actually what it's saying is this thing here. It's contracting over an upper and lower dummy index. That's where this negative sign comes from, right? Because this contraction uses the upper index partial derivative and the lower index partial derivative. And if you go back to our conventions, what you see is that the lower index partial derivative is all 
positive terms, but the upper one has this negative sign. And that's where, when we do the squaring, we end up with this negative sign here in, uh, on the spatial derivative part. So it's important to see that, that uh, this here, this whole thing here collapses to this, which is actually shorthand for this, for uh, the, the two partials. Okay, so then once we have our classical Lagrangian, we immediately look at the Euler-Lagrange equations, right? And that's what this is. This is the Euler-Lagrange equations, which we, I'm pretty sure we derived this previously, and if, it, if we haven't, you should be very, 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 very comfortable with how to get the equations of motion from a known Lagrangian. This is the formula. This is the Euler-Lagrange equation. And it's kind of weird because you're asking, you're taking the Lagrangian and you're taking the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the first derivative of the field, which means you're treating the first derivative of the field as an independent variable. But that's exactly kind of what we are, right? What we are doing. Um, and uh, because it shows up, the field shows up in the Lagrangian as the field itself and its first derivative, which is squared, actually. So you're treating this as an independent variable. And to walk through that derivative, um, I, I want to walk through the taking that derivative very carefully because it is a bit tricky. So the way it starts is, let's, this part's easy, right? The partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the field itself, the only term that has just the field itself in it is this term here. So that's obviously going to be, the two is going to come out, you're going to cancel the two, you're going to get a minus sign m squared. So you get minus m squared times the field. So that takes care of this piece, right? So this piece here goes to that piece there. This other part is, we're going to rewrite it a little bit. Let's see how, it's, how it looks. This partial derivative out in front stays there. And what I'm actually now going to break this down, I'm going to say the partial derivative with, of whatever is in here with respect to the first partial derivative of phi. So I'm now looking at the part of the Lagrangian that is a function of the gradient uh, or, or the, this partial mu of phi. And that part is clearly all of this stuff when rewritten in this form, right? So you got to rewrite it in this form to see the two partials of phi. So here I've rewritten this part here like that, right? So uh, this part here, which is the same as this here, is now being rewritten in that form, right? But notice... I've now changed it to betas, right? Because they're dummy indices, so I can change it to anything. But if I'm going to use mu out here, it could get extremely confusing. So I'm actually going to change it to betas. And then I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to lower this beta so I get uh, partial alpha, partial beta, and then I've introduced a uh, metric, right, to, to re-raise it, basically. And then... And then I'm going to take this derivative with respect to the deri the derivative with respect to this this derivative with respect to mu, right? So we're going to move this in through this structure, or move this in to take the derivative of this guy, and it'll be a product rule, right? It's the partial derivative with respect to the spatial or the uh, the the mu th the partial derivative with respect to mu of the first term, which has got an alpha index times the second term, plus the same thing of the first term times this derivative with respect to the second term. Now, these two guys are going to be delta functions, right? Because you're taking the derivative of itself, but it only makes sense if alpha, oops, if alpha and mu are the same. So this becomes just a delta function. This becomes just a delta function. Eta, alpha, beta is a constant. So you end up with you end up with this term, eta alpha beta, th th this mu alpha uh, turns, uh, this mu alpha uh, turn this alpha here, right? This alpha here was turned into a mu, and this beta here will get turned into a mu, right? From this, from this guy over here. And then 
and then when you add all this together, you just get, you, you, you re-raise the indices and it adds up to one and you get upper partial mu phi, right? And so now this is the term that represents this part in the brackets, right? So now you have everything here in the brackets is now equal to this. And so you put that there, you take the m squared phi, you put that there, and you end up with this guy right here. And that is the equation of motion, right? That is the equation of motion, and that is also called the Klein-Gordon equation. Right, so the Klein-Gordon equation follows from, I guess you would call this the Klein-Gordon Lagrangian, and you end up with the Klein-Gordon equation. Very elegant, very simple little equation. So that's one way of getting there. And in this case, you started with a proposed Lagrangian, right? You said, hey, what's the equation of motion if this is the Lagrangian? And this is, in relativistic form, this Lagrangian is pretty obvious, right? It's just this very simple second derivative of the field, or product of the, I should say, the product of the, um, these two derivatives, and, uh, and a constant term, uh, or a term that's constant proportional to the square of the, uh, the field. So it's not an unusual Lagrangian. And you've, if you list every conceivable Lagrangian that makes some sense, this would be one of them. And, the, and we distinguish it by calling it the Klein-Gordon field. So the Klein-Gordon field is a scalar field that at all moments of time obeys this equation. So if you have a Klein-Gordon field and you substitute it into this equation, you will always get zero, no matter when and where. And that's important because when we start talking about conservation laws, you assume that the field you're dealing with is a Klein-Gordon field, and it satisfies this, and then terms in very complicated expressions for conserved currents will go to zero, assuming this is true. This is often also called on shell, right? Right. If you're a Klein-Gordon field, you that means this this defines being on shell for a Klein-Gordon field. Um, Okay, so that's one way of deriving the Klein-Gordon equation. You start with the Klein-Gordon uh, Lagrangian. Now, notice this is a classical field, right? This is still a field in, in classical physics following all the classical rules. There's no uh, quantum prescription introduced yet. We'll talk about that next. Well, we'll, we'll do another derivation. Uh, no, no, I think we will talk about that next. Okay, so how else can we derive the Klein-Gordon equation? Well, we can start from the special theory of relativity, right? So this is, it, usually this is, I think, the most elementary introduction. The strength is it starts from a place that everybody is very comfortable with, which is special relativity and its de definition of E squared equals P squared M squared, right? And everybody's comfortable with that. The disadvantage is that it immediately begins with first quantization, which admittedly is a term that I've kind of made up, right? It's interesting. Second quantization is a term that everybody who studies field theory at some point runs across. Uh, if you use a very modern book, they have kind of avoid it now. But uh, ultimately, everybody hears of second quantization, but nobody talks about first quantization, right? But if you remember in the last lecture, I pointed out first quantization is simply the prescription from standard quantum mechanics that the energy operator is given by I h bar partial of uh, with respect to time, and the momentum operator is minus I h bar gradient. And... Uh, and this, and this is the prescription in the four-dimensional space-time notation, right? For the, uh, uh, the, this would be the contravariant momentum operator. So, so first quantization is just following the axiomatic prescription that makes quantum mechanics a thing, right? So if you start from the mass-energy relation of of basic special relativity, you just put, I guess in a way to say it, you just sort of put these little operator hats on energy and momentum, right? And you convert this to an operator just using the, the, the prescription that works. And now you've kind of introduced this notion. You've now bought into the entire structure of quantum mechanics at this point. 
Because now what you're saying is measurable things like energy, momentum, are are now represented not by the values that they maintain, but by operators that extract those values from states. And that all falls in a straight line with the philosophical notion, which I think is attributable to, to Heisenberg. I think it was Heisenberg that was the guy who really said, you know what, the only things that matter are things we can measure. And you know, we're going to define states of a physical system in terms of vector spaces, and we're going to create these operators that extract from states measurable things. Very interesting philosophical thing, but that's what quantum mechanics is, right? That's, that's elementary quantum mechanics at its core, and we've discussed this extensively in earlier prerequisite lectures. So if I make these replacements, I, I can just symbolically make them, but if I make them literally and put the operator forms in there, you get this expression, for the, uh, for the relativistic energy-momentum relationship. And then you just start crunching it just like you do before, right? You would divide through by h-bar, and I guess you're left with this. And then um, I think I abandoned, I, I set c equals h-bar equals 1 here, changed some signs a little bit. And then once you have this structure here, you know that that uh, re could be replaced by the, these, this uh, um, uh, What's the word? Um, uh, well, the contracted indices of on the uh, on these operators on these differential operators, and boom, you have the Klein-Gordon equation, right? So the Klein-Gordon equation is a direct, a direct application of standard quantization procedure to the relativistic energy momentum relation, and uh, you'll sometimes see it in this form. But this is the form we're going to use here. You could use it in stake. You could have it in this form, and then uh, uh, inside the definitions of these operators, you could a introduce a c, and um, and then keep this as m c squared over h bar. But no need, no need. We'll just use h bar equals c equals one just to show how elegant it is. And then again, this is so now this is actually. Um, a quantum mechanical equation, right? The last one we called classical because we derived it from a classical Lagrangian. And here we're saying, no, no, we're interpreting, so this is a quantum one. So what's the difference between this quantum field and this classical field, right? It's the same equation. And the answer is, of course, how you interpret phi, right? It's all in the interpretation of phi. Phi in the classical sense is just a straight up value of the field at every instant in time. And here, phi has to be interpreted as some kind of wave function, right? And wave functions themselves have to be interpreted in certain ways. But when we say this is a wave function, we're expecting it to give some kind of probability distribution for the possible outcomes of measurements. Now, famously, this falls apart for the, for the uh, Klein-Gordon equation, for the Klein-Gordon field. The Klein-Gordon field cannot be interpreted that way sensibly, meaning when you solve this equation and you get phi, you don't get something that, that whose square looks like a reasonable probability distribution. And that means quantum mechanics sort of fails for the Klein-Gordon equation. And that's the point of QED. QED fixes that problem, right? QED finds a way to, uh, to, to make this work correctly. And the process there is in QED, you need the step of second quantization to make it work. And there's a real good reason for this, right? Special, you know, regular quantum mechanics deals with single particles, individual particles and their states. But this is somehow an infinity of degrees of freedom. And that's just too much for elementary quantum mechanics to handle. Okay, so that's the second way of getting at the Klein-Gordon equation. So now, let's see, now I wanted to talk about the Hamiltonian form. So we already know about how the, um, the Lagrangian of the Klein-Gordon field looks like. What about the Klein-Gordon Hamiltonian? Well, in order to create the Hamiltonian, you remember, we have to create the conjugate momenta associated with, for, for in the classical, in the normal case, to find the conjugate momentum for a generalized coordinate, you take the Lagrangian and you take its derivative with the 
time derivative of the generalized coordinate, which in our notation will look like this. The time derivative of the generalized coordinate is the zeroth partial. And in the case of our the Lagrangian, we just stick in the Lagrangian and we take the this time derivative here. None of these have zero order derivatives in them, so they go away. And the only one that survives is this first part. You gotta have you, we have to unpack. Remember here look this was this part was partial mu partial mu phi phi. You have to unpack that. And when you unpack it, you end up with this structure, right? We, we basically packed it and then we had to unpack it, right? But ultimately, this is important because uh, only this term will have a time derivative and that time derivative is very simple. It's the, it's the time derivative of the Lagrangian or, or the, I'm sorry, the, the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the time derivative of the generalized coordinate for the Klein-Gordon Lagrangian is simply the time derivative of the field, right? That's what this is, right? Because in, in this case, the field phi is, becomes the generalized coordinate, right? I guess what I should do is this should be more of a, an arrow because the transition from this, this is sort of a demonstration of a reminder of how it works for a single generalized coordinate. Now we're doing it for an infinity of generalized coordinates all wrapped up in this field functions, right? So in other words, this you could put in a value of space-time and each of these phi's would take on a value, right? It would take on a value of phi at some point x, right? And then if you waited some time, this would evolve into uh, phi of the same point x but at a later time t. So I guess I have to, I have to write this, I have to write this a little more thoughtfully, right? I have to write this as t0 and then a point x in space, and that evolves to some other value, t1, at the same point in space. This thing here is sort of your generalized coordinate, right? And that's what we mean by an infinite number of degrees of freedom. This one expression captures this happening everywhere in space-time, where this just happens for one coordinate in the normal construction of elementary Lagrangian's non-classical field theory, just regular particles and, and things moving that are not continua, where you just are using the, the most elementary form of the, of the Lagrangian formulation of classical physics. Q is just represents one number. But here, yeah, phi represents one number, but one number for every single point in space and in time, right? So anyway, the, uh, the way we write this is now is that the conjugate momenta for a field is usually given by, the, by pi of x. And for the Klein-Gordon Hamiltonian, we're in very lucky shape. The, the, it's almost what you would expect it to be. The conjugate momentum is actually just the time derivative of the field itself, which is really nice. And then the Hamiltonian in the classical sort of particle sense is just the sum of the conjugate momentum times the time derivative of the generalized coordinate minus the Lagrangian. And when we, we move this to a, a classical field theory, right, this is all still a classical theory because we're just dealing with a classical Lagrangian. But when we move into a classical field theory, we just write it down in the full way. We now know that P is phi dot and Q is Q dot is phi dot. That's how the translation goes from the basic Hamiltonian to the uh, field version. And then we subtract the Lagrangian, which we've already written down a few times. And when you crunch all the numbers, you end up with this expression right here. This is the, um, uh, the field, the Hamiltonian for the uh, uh, Klein-Gordon field and the, uh, its conjugate momentum. So that pretty much wraps it up. There is one other conversation to have, and that is you can imagine that the Klein-Gordon equation um, is still a scalar field, but it's actually a complex scalar field, right? So now there's an additional degree of freedom because at every point in space-time now, there is a complex number being expressed. And so you can talk about basically two independent values at every point. So you would write down two separate Lagrangians, 
But you could take these two Lagrangians and combine them into one as long as you now consider the field to be um, uh, uh, complex valued, right? So you have a complex valued field. And if you do this combination, you end up with the field and its conjugate, which could also be treated as independent. And now the Klein-Gordon equation is written in this form, right? Where you have, instead of phi squared, you have phi, uh, basically phi conjugate phi, which we'll call phi, phi dagger for now, and you have the partial derivative of phi dagger phi, right? So now you have a Lagrangian where you don't have squares, you have to deal with the fact, the, the price you pay for doing this is that phi now has to be expressed in terms of basically phi conjugate and phi, right? And if you do all that, you end up with two, essentially two independent Klein-Gordon equations, one for each, uh, the real and the complex part of the complex valued field, if that's how you want to break it down, because you could break it down to a real and complex part, or likewise, you could break it down into the field itself and its conjugate value, right? Those, these are all independent. I think in a previous lesson in this QED series, I made it clear how the real and complex part of a complex number is just as independent as the complex number and its complex conjugate. You could treat it both ways. It's sort of obvious, but it does seem weird. To, it always seemed weird to me that this was the same as this, but I actually proved systematically why that was the case in a previous lecture. So the complex Klein-Gordon field is really an important subject because the, the additional um, degree of freedom uh, implies an additional conserved, uh, an additional conservation law, which we're not going to talk about today, but uh, it's significantly different, and ultimately uh, it's uh, linked to electric charge. In fact, I was going to try to talk about the Klein-Gordon field and the nether currents, or the nether currents. I learned that the Germans would say nether for Emily Nether, who discovered all this. And, but we'll do that uh, later after we study the Dirac equation's origins. So what have we done? Well, We've looked at our, we've set up our equations. We understand how to derive the Klein-Gordon field from a classical Lagrangian, and we did it, and uh, we did it carefully. Um, um, I've always found these derivatives here. The partial, I don't even know how to say this, right? The partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the, uh, I want to say gradient of phi. I don't, I don't even know what to, the derivative of phi, right? the derivative of the field. But this is the Euler-Lagrange equation right here, right? So that's part of the prerequisite process. And we understand that we're now going for the physics of a field, right? Which is how every value of this thing changes at every point as time, as time moves on. And uh, from this Lagrangian, once, we have, once we've assumed the Lagrangian, right? The Lagrangian's assumed, right? So this is just one possible physical field, right? So there could be other fields that satisfy other Lagrangians, but not this one. This one's the Klein-Gordon fields, and this is the Lagrangian it satisfies by definition. And we just plug it through to get the equations of motion, and ultimately the equation of motion is the Klein-Gordon equation. And we could also look at it from the concept of relativity, where we use the prescription of first quantization, and we get essentially the same expression, but now we're dealing with a wave function as opposed to a classical field. And then we showed how we can convert, once we know the Lagrangian of the uh, Klein-Gordon field, we can also create the Hamiltonian of it. And the Hamiltonian is important to do because ultimately everything becomes little harmonic oscillators. And so the relationship between uh, a field and its conjugate momenta becomes really important. And that's all part of actual QED, so we're not going to cover that, uh, at least in this series of lectures. And then we discussed the cl complex Klein-Gordon field, because I did say earlier that a scalar field either puts a real number or a complex number at every point in space-time. So we definitely co covered the fact that it could produce a complex number. And you do get a slightly different equation of motion. Um, well, okay, you get the same equation of motion, but you get an extra one of them. So each component, say, of the field the field and its complex part, uh, both independently solve the Klein-Gordon equation, which is something that's going to come up again when we study the Dirac equation. We're going to learn that every component of the Dirac spinner actually satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation.
Okay, so that's getting, these are all prerequisite ideas that you got to have right at the tip of your fingers for, you know, to get ready to study uh, quantum field theory. And so with that, the next lesson will be on the Dirac equation. All right, I'll see you next time.